then 10 years later, I was with a different generation. Breberton High School in uh, 2001, I was visiting them. Had it been 1991, it would have been a different message. But I had a young girl named Brittany show up first in the audience and she sat down and my message used to be convincing people they were special so that they had to look at the unique future they could have. And I, Brittany asked me uh, before the, uh, the conference started, hey, what's this all about? I said, well, I'm here to talk to you about the future you can have because despite what you may have been told, you're special. And she said, well, I know I'm special. I'm told that every day by my parents. And I realized the generations had suddenly changed. Here was a generation that had no problem believing they were special. In fact, the message for them was, you may be unique like everybody else, but you still have to put in the hard work if you want to achieve something. So within a 10-year period, I went from one message to another unknowingly. What resonated just 10 years ago was not going to resonate with this group. They had a completely different outlook on life. And welcome to today's continuing education event. My name is Jessica Morgan with the Lucas OPT, and I will be your host. I am excited to be joined by Joe Esty Sr. He is our Senior Performance Improvement Specialist here at Lucas. Uh, today, we will be going over the generational shift, bridging the gap. Uh, it, Joe and I are the perfect example of a multi-generational workforce, so I'm looking forward to today's presentation as well. It will be interactive, so I look forward and encourage you guys to participate in the polls and follow along. Uh, if you have any questions, there's a Q&A box there. Feel free to submit a question and I'll uh, interrupt Joe and have him answer it for you. Uh, and without further ado, I'm excited to introduce you to Joe Esty. Jessica, thank you very much, and uh, and happy Memorial Day to everybody who's celebrating it this, uh, this weekend, and thanks for joining me on this Friday. Uh, this is one of the most important topics I've come across, uh, not deliberately, but because uh, I had to, uh, in order to adjust the things I communicate in classrooms and in coaching to generations that aren't like me. And I think that's an important message for anyone who has to openly communicate with people who are of a different generation. Um, and uh, of, of a different style of communication. And we'll talk about that. Now, in order to really get the most from this time together, you are going to need something like this to write down on, a pad of paper or a scratch paper, and something like this, a pen, pencil, anything that you can read once you use it. Because there'll be a test. And this test is going to reveal to you where you really fit in in terms of your generational attitudes, preferences, and values, regardless of your birth year. See, we're going to cover some myths right up front that when you were born determines who you are. Uh, the truth is, is that we are more complicated than that. And what does that mean to us in the workplace? So let's start with uh, just today's challenge. And, and we know to summarize it for many organizations we work with, we all want to create a very safe and productive work environment that has to account for the varying characteristics that come with a multi-generational workforce that has traditionally and erroneously been defined as four generations. Uh, so you'll hear generationologists and human resource consultants tell you about the four generations, why it's important to try and entice the new Gen Zers into the workplace, maintain and elevate the millennials, make sure we don't use the Xers, uh, lose them to, uh, to positions in other companies due to their quote unquote lack of loyalty. And then finally, uh, that baby boomers are leaving in droves, which is a reality, but how do we keep them around long enough to get the most from them? And so there are plenty of people who will offer advice on how to do that. Unfortunately, sometimes it's not good advice, and it's not based either on science or based on sociology. And so we're going to talk about some of the realities of generations. And the first one is, is that there's more than four generations out there. If you look at these icons on the screen, you can identify generations by the tweeners. Those are the colors that don't run. They would be, for instance, my parents or young grandparents. Uh, then we have the baby boomers symbolized by the peace sign. We have the Xers symbolized by the MTV logo. We have the millennials symbolized by the selfie wand. And then we have the those umbilical cords at birth to the digital environment Gen Zers we're going to talk about. When I began this talk four to five years ago, they were just leaving high school and entering the workforce. Now they're at the 
ripe old age of 26. It's the Gen Zers and the millennials that will dominate the workforce, some experts say, in terms of 70% of it within the next three to five years. So you can expect a major change from the baby boomer extra dominated workforce today to a generation or two that are going to dominate it differently. So, and we'll give you the new labels for other generations as we move along, but they are certainly more than five in the workforce. Uh, the journey so far for me has been not only have I read up on this topic because it's near and dear to my heart, but I've also experienced generational shifts in my professional life. Back with the Westinghouse Electric Corporation, I was a national community ambassador. My job before it was fashionable to be STEM oriented, science, technology, engineering, and math, we didn't have a name for it. We just went out on engineer week or vocational week and tried to get students in high schools excited about their careers. And I originally worked with people who would now be considered the older Gen Xers. Now back then they had been told a lie either culturally as supported by the media or in the classroom as supported by people around them that they were always gonna work twice as hard to make half as much. They were never gonna have the opportunities, baby boomers did, because corporations were laying people off in droves and they could expect to be in white collar ghettos being software engineers making minimum wage. So that's a dark cloud many of them grew up in. My job was to let them know that you can create the future you want based on the hard work you put into it and a dream you have for it. And the more concrete that is, the more you'll realize it. And so this generation for about 10 years accepted that message. Uh, I went to various high schools and that message resonated with them when they realized the myths they had been told were myths. But then 10 years later, I was with a different generation. Breberton High School in uh, 2001, I was visiting them. Had it been 1991, it would have been a different message. But I had a young girl named Brittany show up first in the audience and she sat down and my message used to be convincing people they were special so that they had to look at the unique future they could have and i Brittany asked me uh before the uh the conference started hey what's this all about i said well i'm here to talk to you about the future you can have because despite what you may have been told you're special and she said well i know i'm special i'm told that every day by my parents and i realized the generations had suddenly changed here was a generation that had no problem believing they were special. In fact, the message for them was, you may be unique like everybody else, but you still have to put in the hard work if you want to achieve something. So within a 10 year period, I went from one message to another unknowingly. What resonated just 10 years ago was not going to resonate with this group. They had an, a completely different outlook on life. And then in 2011, I was with uh, another couple of generations because generations, according to people who study it, now accelerate at the rate of five to eight years. There's no defined rule of thumb, but due to information technology, due to the fact that your neighbor is on Facebook and doesn't have to live in the same cul-de-sac as you in order to get information from you, now we have unlimited opportunities that are only limited by not taking the opportunity to go to information someplace else. And so generations now are no longer a 20 year span, which is known as the biblical generation. It used to be that a two year old was in the same generational value system as a 22 year old, believe that or not. But that hasn't happened since the late sixties. There's nobody 18 who even had the same experience as somebody 28 today in terms of technology, career choices, and expectations. And so we live in a radically new time. And I know that because I work with interns all the time who come into the workplace at Livermore Labs, the Pacific Northwest Labs, or at construction sites. Their expectations of what they want from an employer and the employer's expectations of what they want from them change on an every three to five year basis. For instance, it used to be they wanted somebody who was degreed because the degree meant that you put in enough hard work to attain something. So it was about work ethic as well as academics. Uh, according to most employers in a book written called Life Skills in the 21st Century, uh, just as this century changed, the number one desirable trait that employers are looking for, even still in my conversations with them, is learning agility. They want to be able to have somebody who learns something about situation A 
and can readily apply it to situation B without help. They don't want their, them to be there to be told what to do and how to do it and know that you've done it because you've looked at a standard for doing it. They want you to be more creative in your discretion than that. Now, we also know about generations because of our families. I live in a multi-generational family. I have the generation alphas who are my young grandsons to the tweeners who are my parents. And then sprinkled in between are plenty of Jonesers, Xers, free agents, Xennials, and millennials. And so even within my own household on any given Sunday, we're dealing with more than four generations. Now, here are some resources that you can follow. Uh, Jessica will probably already tell you that you can download the documents and the slides so that you can pick up and study this well beyond our conversation here today. Excellent resources. Some of them are fairly dated. I mean, something that is 2003 now can't be considered a contemporary source when we're living in 2021. But when I wrote it, it was fresh. Just keep that in mind. So let's take a look at the labels, and labels are just that, they're labels. And people like to use labels, not only in terms of generation, but in terms of communication styles, thinking styles, learning styles, because we believe that if we put people in a box, they are easier to manage and understand. We're going to talk about that because we aren't so simple that we can be understood. If we were, we couldn't understand ourselves. I'll let you fester on that one for a while. So there are two types of people in the world. Uh, those who divide people into types and those who don't. And by the way, the people who believe they can't be divided into a type are a category amongst themselves. We do a lot of personality assessments at Lucas, depending on the tool that we're using for the team we're working with. And we always get a couple of folks who say, I can't do these assessments because nobody can pigeonhole me according to a label. And I'll ask them to sit with other people who believe that at the same table, because they'll find they have a lot in common beyond believing you can't be fit into a category. And, and the reason is, is because they believe they can't be fit into a category. So they belong to that very category they believe they can't belong to. And so the, and Madison Avenue said it best, if we couldn't put people into predictable categories and guess their behavior and entice them to buy, then ad agencies would cease to exist. You'd need 7.2 billion different kinds of genes because nobody would like the same one. You'd have 7.2 billion messages on the radio because nobody would like the same one. Let's face it. We have a preference and affinity to things we like for certain things, and that makes us part of a group. Where we err in that belief is when we base that on gender, ethnicity, uh, intelligence tests, and especially generations. We err because we're assigning a characteristic to something that you can assign to something as measurable as your age. So as we take a look at generations, here's something to keep in mind. Normally, we're paying attention to the rule, but there are exceptions. So baby boomers are known as unapologetic workaholics. Within this group, as you see later, there is also the Gen Jonesers, which would have been their younger brothers and sisters, but still within the same generational age. But baby boomers went to work to come back home and go to work. They were the first generation to start a multitude of clubs so that if you didn't have the prestige and status and responsibilities you wanted to at work, You could be the grand poobah of the Water Buffalo Club, like Fred Flintstone was, who we watched when we were kids, when he came home. Quarry worker during the day, president of a club at night. And and a lot of baby boomers sought that status, prestige, or decision-making authority, especially when they didn't have it at work. Uh, We were the first generation to come up with wraparound business cards for titles because we didn't want the same title. Manager didn't say enough about us. So we had to be the deputy manager to the associate director of the deputy undersecretary because somehow that just made us different. Uh, In in addition, we sought status at work. So we started looking at the size of offices, the carpet, the couch in the room. Uh, Conference rooms got bigger and your conference room couldn't be as big as my conference room and the executive washroom. So boomers were all about work. When they came home, they were still about work. Now, That also meant that they didn't leave work. They, most of them, lived to go to work. They didn't work so they could live. Their goal was wrapped up around their title. Made sense because if you were a general 
Motor or General Mills employee or work for IBM, they guaranteed you a lifetime income. You work with us, you don't have to go anywhere else and we'll take care of you. So they were part of the family. Well, dismally, those social contracts fell apart. And the kids of the baby boomers saw that and realized there was no longer a guarantee behind General Motors, General Mills and Ford keeping you. You had to fend for yourself. In addition, the forgotten middle child as they're known, the Gen Xers, uh, were the tattooed anti-heroes. Now, keep in mind that generations are summed up by surveys between their 18th and 26 years. That's the age of formative influence. Movies are aimed at that group. Marketing is aimed at that group. They're influential on what they buy and do. Uh, college choices are made by that group. So that 18 to 26 year framework is what happened to you to make you think a certain way by that age, and that's how we label you through a survey. One of their surveys was, uh, what's uniquely different about your generation, Gen X and boomers? And 33% of them answered that they had at least one tattoo. And by the way, they didn't share the same heroes as their parents. See, baby boomers, their heroes were important people who became celebrities. So Neil Armstrong, Martin Luther King Jr., uh, John F. Kennedy, they went out and did something, then they became a celebrity. The forgotten middle child Gen Xers saw their parents come home from work and they kicked the cat, they cursed the dog, they complained about the boss, and they realized they didn't want to be like them. That after all those years of working hard, they found nothing but complaints in the work they did. As people were laid off, as companies changed hands and Lockheed Martin went to another group, their parents realized that loyalty was never to an organization. Loyalty had to be something different. Gen Xers became loyal to themselves. And it was a fight for survival because many were known as latchkey kids. They were dropped off as and it wasn't the babysitter or daycare center who took care of them. They took care of each other. You see, these were kids who raised kids. They were expected to be responsible, and they became fiercely independent. Now, the older generation saw that. And by the way, boomers were the first generation to be raised by television. Uh, but when they saw that, they said, these kids are fiercely independent. Therefore, they must never be loyal. Oh, no, they're an extremely loyal generation but they are loyal to people, they are not loyal to companies. Why would they be? Because companies were suddenly not loyal to their parents. And so there was a reaction, and you'll notice that when we get to it, that there were two Gen Xers. There were the slackers early on, who were the couch surfers and the video game pioneers, and then there were the free agents who did something with that technology, like Michael Dell, who was a free agent. Wanted to do something different, wanted to be the man, not work for the man like his parents did. So Gen Xers were one of the first generations in US history to have as their fifth largest business occupation title on a census, business owners. They went to work for themselves, bike shops, surf shops, restaurants. They didn't wanna work for a corporation restaurant. They wanted to open up their own shop and that makes them uniquely different. And then we have the Gen Deers that many people call the millennials, but of course there are three different generations within the millennials. There are the Gen Yers, the first to uh, hit the frontier. Then we have the Zennials, and then we also, also known as Special K, and then we also have the uh, Generation Digitals, those who are the younger brothers and sisters of that group. They were the first to be known, according to a book written by a Microsoft manager, as the Trophy Babies. They were the ones, as a first generation, who got a second place award for showing up to a soccer game and not winning. Uh, they always got an award, even if they got a D on their paper, a little squirrel with a smiley face that said, you did well. They were the first generation who unfortunately were raised by people who saw what they had done to the Gen Xers and telling them that days are dark, it'll be gloomy, you'll never have the job you want, and realized that we may have damaged that generation's self-esteem. So in this case, we overdid it with the self-esteem. This is the first generation to be told that you should have a strong sense of self-esteem without remembering the strong self-worth, that you're not special. You're breathing. See, they didn't get that message. They got the message, you are special because you're breathing. We know that because public schools across the United States started seeing this in their classroom. Hey. Attendance is important. 
And you'll get a C in this class if all you do is show up. No other generation was told that beforehand. You actually got measured by the work you did. And now if you're breathing when you show up to class, you're at least going to come out of there with the C. Now, what do you think that made them like when they went into the workplace? By showing up to work on time, they had to get something for it. That's why they were called the trophy babies. Now, you always know a millennial because they're the only generation that hates to be called millennials. And so if they say, well, that's not me, they're probably right because millennials are very different and unique. But they're the one generation that never liked the title that they ever got for their generation. And then you've got the ones that are coming into the workplace now between the ages of 18 to 26, the generation like me. You see, way back in the boomer years, when disco was very popular, populated, Time Magazine called us Generation Me. Big cover spread of Generation Me, the disco era. Well, the generation today is known as Generation Like Me because they can't go a day without a like being sent to them in text, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, or whatever else is coming down the road. And they live for it on a regular basis. They've got to get that instant feedback. They have the digital umbilical cord, And then after this are the Generation Alphas because they have yet to be named. And those are their younger brothers and sisters at home who, if you have kids who are between the ages of two to eight, know how to get anything they want digitally on Google and YouTube, even if they can't read a word. Now, that makes no sense. You have to be able to read to search. Yet they know how to find anything anywhere without even being able to read before they get into school. And We don't even know what's going to happen with that generation yet. So here's the rule. You know, I before E except after C has never been really a rule in English, even though we taught it as that. It's been the exception because there are 48 words that follow that rule over 940 in our language that don't. So somebody stuck that as a rule to help us remember. All it does is confuse it. So there is a 70-30 rule when it comes to generations. And it just means that What I'm going to tell you today about the generations and their value system, what they like and what they don't like, fits probably 70% of the people. Because when surveys were sent out to them between the ages of 18 and 26, they said, here's what we're like, which meant 30% of them disagreed. So keep in mind, a stereotype doesn't work in managing people, managing conditions, enticing people or rewarding them, because it's a stereotype you'll get about a 70% average of people who are into what you think they're into. And 30% aren't anything like that. That's the assessment we're going to take here in a second that'll show you what you're really like. Here's an example. 72% of Gen Zers prefer face-to-face communication with their managers and coworkers. Think about the stereotype we've given them. We think they were born digital, so we think they prefer Zoom, Snapchat, uh, teams meetings. They don't. When it comes to finding honesty and transparency in the workplace, they want a face-to-face meeting. Anybody can digitally reach out to you. That meant you took no special effort to get to know them. Managers who want to flourish with Gen Zers had better do it in person, and they better be personable in their approach. That generation knows the difference between digital and authentic, and they're looking for authenticity. Uh, 73% of Gen Xers on a survey about their heroes, we said Neil Armstrong and John F. Kennedy, as I said earlier about baby boomers, they said over 70% their parents and grandparents. You see, they knew the difference between celebrity and importance. Gen Xers, who had to raise themselves in that fierce, independent environment, knew that the people you have to be loyal to are the ones who are the most loyal to you. And it isn't people on TV or who write songs. Now, if you look at the millennials when it comes to heroes and their asked in their formative years, they listed people who were celebrities who they believe are important. See, it's been a flip to the boomers. So if you can sing a song, If you can act on stage, if in any way you can make a name for yourself through some novelty uh, floss dance you might do on YouTube, then you must be important and worth listening to, which has completely flipped the Celebrity Importance Index. And then finally, the Gen Zers at this point in time on the surveys done with them believe their families are the most important. And so we're going to talk about that here in a moment. But 
let's take a look just at what these generations might look like. Let's correct some stereotypes. One of the most common erroneous assumptions made, especially by managers, teachers, and mentors, is confusing a lack of ability or current capability with a lack of motivation or interest. You see, you're trying to teach them something. And they don't look as passionate about it as you are. And so we'll mistake that for a lack of interest and motivation when really they just want to know how to do what they need to do. They want to know why it's important to do it that way. They want to know the what, and we're trying to convince them too often about the why. You know, they're motivated, they're interested, but they really need something they can walk away with. And telling them they're not interested doesn't help. Jennifer was a gal I worked with at a public utility district, and she was a traditional baby boomer. She believed, like a lot of us, that nobody had to teach us anything. We had to learn it for ourselves. Of course, we suffer from nostalgia, meaning we have a longing for nostalgia, but all of us have amnesia because it wasn't really like that in the past. And we'll always say, hey, I had to learn it the hard way. I got the training scars. Nobody told me how to be professional in the workplace. Nobody told me how to answer the phone because we've forgotten all the people who actually taught us. And every one of us learned it from someone. We just don't like to admit that. Now, Jennifer is that stereotype. And she said, I got this millennial gal out there at the front desk named Michelle, and she will not put down her phone. She has got to be on that thing all day. And I asked her how it's affecting the work. Well, she gets it done, but it's not done to my standards. Have you shared those standards with her? Well, nobody had to share those standards with me, she told me. So she ought to know what the standards are. I said, oh, well, that's interesting. You know why she's on her phone? Oh, man, she's probably testing her friends and all that. Understand this about the millennials. They are the most connected to the family and friends generation we've ever had because they can be. They can't go an hour without finding what's going on with somebody in their family. You have to understand Gen Xers and baby boomers in the workplace called their family at lunch and they called them at the end of the day. They didn't call them during the day. The free agents started calling them because they had the technology to do it. But the majority waited until the appropriate time to find out what was going on. Man, you would drive a millennial or a Gen Zer up the wall if in the next hour they didn't know what was going on. Now, by the way, they didn't do that to themselves. They did that because guess who's texting on the other end? You know, mom is trying to find out what's going on with you. You know, sister wants to know what you're doing after work. You know, here's the problem. We tend to look at the next generation as if they raised themselves without realizing that we did a lot to pave the way for the car they're driving. And so when we take a look at generations, I asked Jennifer, I said, well, what's the main thing you want from Michelle? I want her to pay attention and do her job well. What have you done to help her do that? She said, you know, set those standards. You need to pay attention and do your job well. But, well, those really aren't standards. Those are goals. What have you done to help her do that? Well, nothing, because nobody helped me. This is a cyclical argument we're getting into here. And so I said, okay, so have you ever walked her through the process and taken her from step A to step B to step C and everybody who touches that process in human performance? We call it a touch the process analysis. So people clearly understand the expectation, the standard for which, well, why would I do that, Joe? I didn't have to have that. And I said, Jennifer, humor me for a second. If you really want her to improve her performance, you're going to have to do more than call her unmotivated and disinterested. You're actually going to have to give her a process for learning things. I was back about three weeks later. She said, hey, you know, that gal is on her phone all the time still, but you wouldn't believe the what she's doing now. She's actually paying attention to what she's doing because I think she understands it now. Well, she probably does, Jennifer. Now, here's the whole point. It's easy to look at another generation and tell them they aren't like you without helping them learn the way you did. And not everyone can learn the way you did because there are different conditions and expectations we live under now. So when it takes a look at generations, here's why this matters. In human performance, there's an equation that's only part of the equation. Behavior plus performance produces results. You want results? Well, you have to give somebody a way to perform, but you also have to improve their behavior if you think it's wanting. That's the traditional approach. At Lucas, through our research, we know behaviors are the sum total of the condi conditions we grow up and work under and the expectations that were set for us. You see, there's behavior is actually the end of the equation. It's not the beginning of the equation. People are who they are for a reason. 
And a lot of those reasons have to do with conditions and expectations. So every generation had a different set of conditions walking into the workplace, and they certainly had a different set of expectations walking into the workplace that shapes our behavior. So when we look at all these different generations, here's what we know based on who we were when, a famous saying by Morris Massey, a sociologist, that significant emotional events tend to shape who we are. They don't solely shape who we are, but every generation up to this point in time could be labeled World War I, World War II, Watergate, and the World Trade Centers. So we are all shaped by different Ws. Now, we all went through several of those, but it doesn't mean we think alike, we act alike, or behave alike. Just as we go to this assessment, keep in mind that baby boomers raised most of the millennials. Gen Xers are raising most of the Gen Zers, except for the 19 million Gen Zers in the United States currently being raised by their grandparents because Gen X parents aren't raising them for whatever reasons, and I should say a multitude of reasons. Now, we were shaped as baby boomers by Vietnam, Watergate, and civil rights. Uh, the, the, the next generation was shaped, I'm trying to advance that. Next generation was shaped by the, uh, so, the end of the social contract and the end of lifetime employment by IBM and GM, the World Wide Web. And they woke up every day when they were Gen Xers to a new environmental disaster like Old Paul India and the Exxon Valdez. And then the next generation, Gen Zers, are shaped by social networking, uh, the Great Recession, as they've come to know it in the media, and then also a high level of volunteerism and causes. The generation that currently volunteers, largest in number, are not the gray hairs anymore. It's not the silver-heeled silver citizen, uh, senior citizen that volunteers now. It's the kids who are the number one at volunteering, and they volunteer for all kinds of causes. So generations are labeled and defined by their birth year, their formative years, like what was happening when, and then also by how they got accustomed earlier to technology. All too often, though, the one label we hear about is the birth year. So I'm going to show you a series of labels in years. And step number one, I need you to write down the label somebody gave you for your birth year. So on this assessment, you need to know what somebody said you were part of. Tweeners would be 1% of the workplace today. And if they are, they're the older retiring generation in the boardroom or they own the business and haven't given up. But they're between the ages of 75 to 85, and they're leaving the workforce in droves. Uh, tweeners were known as that because they had heard about the Great Depression and World War I, even though they personally were just kids in it and hadn't experienced it firsthand like their parents. So they always knew that you could have bad times, but they personally had lived in pretty good times. So they always have a pickup truck in their garage right next to the Corvette they wasted money on. Or they tell their kids, hey, you got to save every dime because you don't know when the world's going to end. Well, they blow $3,000 in Las Vegas because they are between generations. Then we have the baby boomers who were there because we had this big boom of babies being born at the end of World War II, heading us into the age of plastic and TV dinners. But those younger brothers and sisters like myself, between the ages uh, uh, or birth years of uh, 57 to 64 were Jen Jonesers. We took everything your older brothers and sisters did in the workplace, and then we brought it home to the suburb because suburbs grew like mushrooms back then where we moved out of the cities to move further away from those cities in order to have houses that all looked alike. It was the age of the McMansion and the age of the black SUV. If my neighbor got a pool, I had to have a pool. If they had an SUV, I had to have an SUV. We were peeking over our neighbor's fences, keeping up with the Joneses. That's where that saying came from. Now, Gen X slackers were the ones who rebelled to their parents' way of conformity and corporate life. And they were slackers because they were the mall rats. They were the anti-heroes. They were the ones who wanted to be the people their parents didn't like. And then their younger brothers and sisters saw that wasn't so successful for them. So they decided to write their own ticket and become Gen X free agents. So once again, remember, you're writing down the label somebody gave you for your birth year, if you're following along. Free agents figured out 
that you don't want to maybe own your own business and you don't want to work for somebody who owns a business. You want to work for yourself by being a free agent. Get to know and do as best you can so you can go to anywhere you want and write your own pink slip before they do. They took control of their career. Now, Zennials were the in-between, the free agents and the millennials, and they kind of share the cusp of both skills and vulnerabilities for them. Part free agent, but also part Generation Y. Knows how to use technology very well, but as Jessica and I talked, they also know what a floppy disk look like. They use a fax machine and they use a cell phone. They're comfortable using both technologies, whatever works to get the job done. Now, Generation Wires, the millennials, were the first to want to be uniquely different, just like everybody else. They were the first that uh, understood diversity was not something you have to teach because they live it. In a great book you ought to read one day, The Millennial Myth, written by millennials, they will tell you they don't understand this love affair with diversity because in their generation, it was just a natural way of life. You don't have to teach somebody about diversity. They grew up in it. The only thing in common they have with the nuclear family that the baby boomers have is their families are subject to meltdowns just like everybody else. And so we wrote the book in order to help a generation understand Heather has two mommies. They grew up with Heather having two mommies in some stasis. That is not unusual to them. That is not even radical to them. That is a, just the way it is. So the whole point is, is telling them about diversity is not as interesting as you'll read in the book about talking about coversity, what we have in common rather than what divides us. What millennials and Gen Zers want to know is what we have in common with human beings in the workplace, not understanding that our perspectives should divide us, but our purpose should unite us. That's the whole point. They want to see the unity between us. And then Gen Zers, they're kind of new to the workplace. As you notice by the dates, they will be getting out of high school, getting out of college and entering the workplace. And their big thing is, is they don't want to be millennials. If you read the book, The Gen Zers at Work, the biggest argument in the workplace right now is not between boomers and millennials. The biggest arguments are the ones that are coming between Zers and millennials because they want entirely different things out of life. And then we got these kids at home called Generation Alphas that we won't talk about today because they're too young to talk about right now. So as we go here, what label is currently signified by your birth year? So you saw the years, you wrote down the label, which of those are most of you like or ascribe to? And I think, Jessica, this automatically sums and tallies it up, right? Or do I have to slide? Nope. It automatically does. Okay. That's a boomer asking, you know, a zennial for advice here, just so you know. <laughs> Actually, a Jen Joneser, I should say. So, 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 who do, so I'm curious to see who we have in the audience, and then we'll, see, we'll do a post-survey to see if you were true to your label. <laughs> I think we're close. Okay. I think we're good. Go ahead, Joe. Okay. Oh, look at that. So we got Generation X slackers, then we got boomers. And then not a lot of tweeners or, or those Jonesers, just everybody in between. Okay, so so interesting. We'll see if you were true to your label here in a moment. So here's us on the label, and we need to understand the difference. Your generational age is a combination of your birth date because of what happened to you when. So Vietnam, Watergate, World Trade Center. So it's your birth date. Your generational personality is shaped by your family, your friends, and your experiences. And your generational skills fluency is based on how willing you are to give up that cell phone in your hand to use the next newest technology and not see it as a radical change. And so when we take a look at this personality assessment, I'm going to ask you six questions. Please put the letter down, one through six, that best reflects the way you see the question 
from your perspective? You know, why, why do you think your answer to the question is? Now, if you can't make up your mind and you put two down, put both of them down because it'll just prove the point. Proves the point if you put both down. So here's the first one. When it comes to my occupational job, I tend to see my job as a chore with a contract. When it's over, it's over. My life is not defined by what I do at work. Or B, it's a means to a personal end. It better be more than a job. It should have personal fulfillment. Or C, I see it as a stable, secure, and financially rewarding opportunity to grow. D, it's an obligation. It's called work for a reason. Not everybody was meant to find meaning in it. And E, it's an exciting journey and a challenge. And if it's not an exciting journey and a challenge, I'm going to go find some place where it is. So you're putting either one letter down or two, hopefully one. That would better sum this up for you. So, putting one of those letters down. Okay. Question number two. I would describe the way I approach my work at work as entrepreneurial. I like to do things my own way, which is probably different than the status quo. B, participative and social. I like to be involved with people doing things when we have a common purpose. C, novel, unique, but connected to others, wanting to work with people on something bigger than myself. D, individualistic. Hey, we all have our own strengths. We don't always have to be a team to get things done. And then E, team-centered, but it's important you recognize us on an individual basis. I'm going to leave that up for a second. So which of those best speaks to you? Okay, question number three. When it comes to meetings at work, and folk, I'm not talking about the meetings we have to go to that are important, like project meetings, the start of a project. I'm talking about staff meetings every Monday at one o'clock. Like, you know, I don't even know if we have to meet or not, but it's just a good idea if we virtually or in live person connect. But on those regularly scheduled staff meetings, do you A, see them as a waste of time and you hate them intensely? Why meet? Just tell me straight what you want me to have done. B, meetings are important. And they don't have to be face-to-face. -face. They can be remote meetings, but they give me time to check my messages. And that's the time I can check out of work and actually check into my messages. Uh, C, they need to be face-to-face. -face. They need to be physical, and everyone should have an equal chance to be heard at these meetings. D, they're a necessary evil, but I, the right people better be at those meetings, and I mean by the right people, management, otherwise nothing gets done. Or E, they're the next best thing to personal face-to-face -face meetings, you know, one-on-one. -on -one. And if we don't meet, how in the world are we going to discuss the status of our organization and our work? So as you're looking at those five, which speak to you the most? Okay. Question number four. Now, when it comes to feedback at work, you know, when I'm doing something, you're going to provide feedback. A, I'll usually ask for feedback when I want it or I need it because formal feedback systems like you walk and turn around just to coach me are a waste of time and you're only doing it because you have to. I like straight to the point feedback. Don't sugarcoat it. Just tell me what, what's bothering you. Or B, I need feedback often to know if I'm doing the right thing in the right way. Or C, I prefer face-to-face -face feedback with personal conversations. I need to be able to read the person's face that's providing me the feedback to see their honesty. A D, no news is good news. I'm usually more critical of what I do than what anybody else is going to say to me. Or E, doesn't matter because if the feedback is not tied to money, promotion, greater decision-making authority beyond what you're telling me, then what difference does it make? So that feedback better be tied to something material in some way. So when it comes to feedback, which of those is the value that you have? Now, question number five, rewards. Now, let's say a company has an unlimited a la carte menu, and you as an employee get to pick the rewards you want. And we're going to give you five options, and you can pick them. You tell me what you want. A, freedom and time off. Those are the best rewards a person can have. Or B, more meaningful work being assigned to me 
is the greatest reward. Or C, being involved in big projects with lots of flexibility. Or D, satisfaction is its own reward. I don't need a bonus system or an incentive. You already pay me a paycheck. Or E, money, promotion, and increased decision-making and authority. That would be the best reward. So which of those? I know there might be others you might like out there, but if I said, hey, you got to pick one of these, which of those would you pick as your reward this year? You know, six, the last of the questions, when it comes to communicating a new way of doing something, we're changing a policy, the way we do work, our absence policy, for instance, or when we start work, whatever that change is, getting notified about the change, A, you want direct, immediate notification from your boss, and it doesn't have to be a meeting. Just tell me. Just send me an email, tell me what you want. B, it has to be an email, a text, or voicemail. I really don't care as long as somebody tells me as soon as possible. And notice, it can be somebody. It doesn't have to be the boss. C, face-to-face -face communication. I need to know the intent and the specifics behind this change, so I need to be able to ask you questions. I need to be able to ask you questions. D, I want formal communication. You're changing something. I want to see somebody's authorized signature on that policy. Otherwise, I don't accept it. I want a letterhead sent to my mailbox. And then E, I prefer face-to-face -face conversation before you even make that change so we can discuss it before it happens. I prefer face-to-face -face communication before you make that change so we have a chance to meet and discuss it. So which of those best mirror your values? Okay, we're going to tally them here in a second. And you have to go back to that generational label you wrote down because somebody said, like a Chinese astrology chart, you're the year of the dog because you're a baby boomer. So now go ahead and tally them. You got A, B, C's, D's, and E's. Now here's the scores. If you wrote any of those down as an A, you reflect the values of a Gen Xer. If you wrote any of them down as a B, you're a millennial in terms of their values and what they want out of work. If you wrote any of those down C, you're a Gen Zer. If you had a D, you're a tweener. And if you had an E, you're a baby boomer. Now, now we're going to have a poll here in a second, but I have done this with hundreds of people across the United States. And it is a rarity that somebody who said they were an Xer has all A's on their paper. Or if they were an E, a baby boomer, they have all E's on their paper. It is a rarity. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but I can't count on one hand the times that it has happened. Uh, so, so they're out there somewhere. So, for instance, Jessica, just because I can speak live to you, what was your birth year? And don't, uh, don't tell me your year. Sorry, that might be too much information. Tell me your label. I am a zennial. You're a zennial. So you should be in that B category, typically. And what what was your mosaic of letters? A. I had uh, four A's. Wow. Uh, I had one B. I had one C. And one of those A's, it could have also been a D. Okay, now think about that. So you even have a value on one of those questions that Gen Zers embrace, which are furthest away from Gen Xers or the Zennials. So, mm -hmm. so notice. And, and so we're going to put up a poll. And I'd be curious to see, uh, did you match? Did you? If you said you were an E, you had all E's, or was it only five or six? Match one of four, or you match none of them? Yeah. So, so did your birth year match your letter of the alphabet answer, the majority or minority of the time? So we know about Jessica's. I will tell you that my own, I have three that are generation Z's and I have two that are Xers and I only have one that's a boomer. Now, I will also share with you in high schools across the United States and in freshman college campuses where we've done this in the last three to four years, the majority of Gen Zers and millennials have more in common with tweeners than they do with the kids sitting the next to them in the aisle. So they have a lot of tweener values. Wherever they got those from, I don't know, but it's just where they 
where they rest. Okay, do you think we can total up? Well, you've got the – so, look. okay, so we got some who didn't match any, and we got some who – well, nobody really was reflective of their true label, which shows you how valueless those labels might be. Now, here's why this is important from a company perspective. Uh, you might have a human resource consultancy or a group of managers who have been misinformed about generations, and they'll try to sell you on the idea of selling generations based on what they think their values are for a whole host of things, incentive programs, compensation packages, uh, managing heirs, training programs. So you might hear somebody say in the training department, well, you know those millennials, we're going to have to have a lot of hands-on digital equipment for them to learn. Well, you can't say that about millennials. Millennials are just as different of all generations in terms of learning. You can't tell Gen Zers because they were born with a cell phone in their hand that they would prefer to have computer-based training because they don't really want to listen to an adult instructor anyway, when we already know 72% of them said they like face-to-face -face personal communication. And so there are groups of people who have been misinformed because we tend to relate a birth year and what somebody said to the characteristics they couldn't know about. People need to be treated as individuals. They need to be managed as individuals. So when you're managing different folks. It is important, and you'll have these slides to keep these in mind. We have different work ethics, and we see work differently. For instance, baby boomers, workaholics, they worked efficiently. They wanted the job done right. They were in crusading crusades because before today's Zers joined all those causes, remember the causes of the 60s and 70s and civil rights and protesting or supporting the war, we were the first to support those causes. At personal fulfillment, and we questioned authority. We didn't accept things just because the boss said it. Now, Gen Xers and Xennials, they like to eliminate the task as possible, redefine it in their own terms. They're very self-reliant. They want structure and direction because they're very skeptical that just because somebody said it had to be done that way, it has to be done that way. And they're skeptical of corporations and skeptical of formal work systems. Work is an exciting adventure to a baby boomer, mission focused to a Gen Xer. Uh, it's a difficult challenge, and there's a contract. Zennials and Gen Xers don't live to work. They work to live. That doesn't mean they don't find fulfillment in their work, but there's life beyond work because they want a blended life. They don't want just a balanced life. Z boomers were told to have a balanced life. When you're at work, think about work. You're at home, think about home. And we didn't. We are at work, we thought about home. We're at home, we thought about work. And balancing is like a teeter-totter. Doesn't always work. Blended, easier to do because you are who you are and you do what you do. Leadership styles, we wanted consensual, collegial, and collaborative management as baby boomers. We're the first to have those staff meetings where everybody got together. Our tweener parents were told you don't make those decisions, it's above your pay grade. And then they told their bosses when they were asked to make decisions, I don't make them, they're above my pay grade. And then all of a sudden boomers wanted it within their pay grade to make decisions. Whereas the Xennials and the Xers, everyone is the same. Your boss may have a title, but that doesn't mean they're more important. And you're gonna challenge them and you're gonna ask why. Interactive styles, boomers were the first team players. They were participative and they needed to meet. Whereas Xennials were the entrepreneurs. They're the ones who hate meetings. Why go to a meeting when all you gotta do is just say, here's what needs to be done. Feedback and rewards, we don't appreciate feedback unless it's tied to something more meaningful than just telling me I did a good job. What's that mean to me in terms of my career? Uh, whereas Xennials and Xers, freedom is the best reward. They want to know, they, they want to know how what they're doing matters, and giving them freedom and time away from work is something that matters to them. And then message that motivate, boomers were told, hey, you're valued and you are especially needed around here. Whereas extras and Xennials respond to this, hey, do it your own way, forget the rules. Man, if you can throw the rules out, as a famous uh, 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 a book not too long ago said, break all the rules first, uh, get out there and do it your own way because that's what we value. Then take a look at what's soon to be 70% of the workforce. Because remember, Xers, when their parents had kids, Xers were 
kids per family. Boomers were 4.8 kids per family. It isn't that Xers don't care about work. There's just not many of them at work because they were the lightest population we ever had in U.S. history. There weren't a lot of Xers that were being born. And also, please remember that Xers were the first group to grow up playing video games where the person that you were always trying to beat on the next level was called the boss. And they were called the boss informally, kid to kid in every neighborhood across the United States, because they heard their baby boomer parents talking about the boss always being the enemy and never your friend, your adversary, never your advocate. That generation is the one who made up the name boss to be a bad thing. So imagine that when you get into the workplace. Currently, according to experts, they suffer the greatest deficit in terms of leadership in the workplace. Because if they didn't start their own business, they didn't want to run a business. Because like on Survivor and Big Brother, two popular shows for most Xers, you don't want to be the person who stands out. Because the person who stands out gets cut. You just want to be the person who does your own thing, but you don't want the accolades to go along with it because that means you're next on the chopping block. Why assume authority when you can take control? There's a big difference between the two. Why assume authority when you can take control? So here's the deal. Millennials get into the workplace and they don't want to work for a paycheck. They also want a purpose because they've heard that from their extra brothers and sisters work for a purpose. But Gen Zers are very sensitive about money and job security because they've seen a lot of job insecurity and they want to make a difference. But surviving and thriving are more important. Uh, millennials aren't pursuing job satisfaction. They're usually pursuing their own development. The bumper sticker for millennials is they're highly ambitious, but sometimes don't have the ability that goes along with it. There's no problem convincing millennials they want to be ambitious. They're ambitious, but they need to have the ability to go along with it. Zers, they want to accumulate rewarding experiences. They tend to be impatient because they have a fear of missing out. Remember, they got to get those likes every hour on the hour, and they're afraid that a text they miss may be so important that people will misread it as if they're not important in responding. Uh, they don't want bosses, millennials. They want coaches. Uh, whereas in, uh, as, in, as uh, Zers, they want to be mentored in an environment where they can advance quickly. And they want to look to the leaders in the eye. And they want honesty and transparency because they haven't seen it in leadership in their lifetime. And they don't want to fix weaknesses, millennials. They just want to work on their strengths. Whereas Gen Zers have shown a lot of weaknesses and a lot of leaders and the people they have either been raised with or raised by. And so they want to have the tools to win. You can't win unless you know what your weaknesses are. They don't shrink back from knowing their weaknesses. They don't think it's fair if you don't tell them. And they want to develop both their weaknesses and strengths to turn them into strengths. And then finally, uh, the millennials have a collaborative mentality where everybody pitches in where now this is unique, imagine the workplace conflicts we're gonna have here, whereas those under 26 are highly competitive. 72%, remember that 70-30 rule? 72% said they will openly compete with everybody else to get that job and do the same job. Um, and they're independent. They want to be judged based on the nature and the performance of their work. So therein lies the conflict. So hopefully you've gained some insight into your own generational assessment. Uh, hopefully you'll also download the slides and go look at the resources and references I, uh, I shared. Uh, there's a host of things to learn that we couldn't cover today. We only got two or three minutes to answer any questions. Anybody have one they'd like to pose? Uh, for those that missed it earlier, there is a Q&A box here. Uh, feel free to submit any questions you have. Uh, while we give you some time for any of those questions to come in, I'd like to thank Joe for taking the time today to join us. Um, I am, am fascinated by my own responses to realize that I am, have more of a Gen X mentality. Granted, I have three older brothers that are all Gen Xers. Uh, yeah. I married a Gen X. Um, and I'm, I'm curious to see what this last year has done both to um, Gen Zers in the workforce and what it will mean for my children 
when they yeah. enter the workforce because you know, so many of us are no longer working in the office. I work from home. And so my children are seeing mom and dad both working from home, sharing an office at home. And what will that do for them? And the the trend trending of uh, more millennials becoming independent contractors and years becoming independent contractors. I mean, I'm a perfect example of that, that most of my career has been as a 1099 employee. So, um, I, it'll be interesting to see, and I'm looking forward to going back through your descriptions here. So I did not see any questions coming oh, in. Okay. Uh, Joe, thank you so much for joining us thank today. You. Thank you for all of our attendees. Be sure to check our website and follow us online uh, for our next continuing education event. We do these monthly. We also have regular uh, micro learning check-ins. We call them our performance tips. So feel free to check our website, lucasopt.com, and follow us on social media for more information. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.